Jennifer Westacott, welcome to the program. Thanks very much. Now, it looks like in Victoria the bulk of restrictions could potentially still be in place for another six weeks. Is that fair enough or too long, in your view? Look, I, I'm really worried about Victoria from what I've read uh, today. Um, now, we haven't seen all the industry-specific information, but, you know, if, if this looks like, to your point, a very long road out, and what is a long road out that's not in sync with uh, what other states are doing, particularly in New South Wales, that means more job losses, more business failures. Uh, it means businesses leaving Victoria. Uh, it means a sense of hopelessness that I think has crept into Victoria, which is bad for people's mental health. Uh, what we need is a plan to get business going again. So people with COVID safe plans where there's no transmission, why can't they open? Businesses that were open during the last harsh lockdown, a lockdown that worked, David, because we know that 99% of the second wave cases came from uh, breaches of quarantine, mistakes. Why can't those businesses, if they've got COVID safe plans, no transmissions, be open? If there are regions in Victoria where there haven't been cases, why can't they open? We need a plan that is simple, that is predictable, that does not go backwards. Uh, we need a plan that looks at that local hotspot management you've just been talking about and learns from New South Wales, which is doing this really well. And what's the benefit there? You know, the benefit is 314,000 jobs that were lost in the first wave are back. And this is not about statistics. This is about people's lives. This is about the businesses they built all their lives. It's about that sense of hope versus despair. And we need a plan that gives hope today. OK, but the modelling that the Victorian government is relying on uh, shows very clearly that at even 25 cases a day, there's still uh, a great risk of uh, cases taking off, of this yo-yo effect. That's not good for anyone's health and wellbeing, let alone for business either. Uh, of course not. No one wants a third wave here. But I think we have to find a practical, achievable, sustainable plan forward that also allows things to get back. That's my point. Things but he, that just were to be clear not on this, shut. Are you, saying, are you saying that at 25 cases, say 20 to 30 cases, we should be able to reopen in Victoria? Well, well what I'm saying is let's, we want to see that modelling today. And I mean, you've obviously been talking about it, but what's going to be the threshold? And, and I might go back to my question. Things that were shut, well, were not shut rather, in the first stage of what was a very harsh lockdown, that have not had cases, um, why aren't those things allowed to open? That's my question. Regions that have had no cases, why aren't they allowed to open? Bunnings, Target, Kmart, Big W, Officeworks, th these have had 10 million customers. They see about 10 million customers a year. No customer transmissions. Why can't these things start to open? Because the consequences of this, David, are really severe for the national economy, for the Victorian economy, for sure, people's sure. wellbeing. And look, I, I, I can't talk to the customer transmission point you make there, but we did get to the point where there were more than 700 cases a sure. day in Victoria. So clearly the movement of people was a problem. That's, that's absolutely right. But let's work with industry. Let's, let's make sure that where people have got those COVID safe plans, that we can open more industries up that we can get the state going again. How's the consultation been with the Victorian government in, in putting together this plan? Look, you know, there has been consultation, but look, I don't think it's been good enough. Um, and, and I think it's one thing to tell businesses things. It's another thing to work with them to try and make sure we don't get a third wave and that we keep things going. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, the big supermarkets, they employ over 100,000 people in Victoria alone they had to get their workforce reduced by 30% in just a few days. Uh, construction, particularly civil works, where you're talking about hectares, not square metres, shut. Uh, you're talking small businesses that stocked up their inventory, getting 24 hours notice to close down. If I contrast that to New South Wales and to the federal government, when this all started, every week, David, uh, the Treasury in, in the Commonwealth and would have all the employer groups on the phone, working through problem by problem, how do we make that work better? And that, ha that hasn't New happened in Victoria, is what you're saying? Absolutely say. not. Okay. In New South Wales, every week, every week, David, the Treasury, the Health Department, the Transport Department, sitting down with businesses, OK, how do we make that work better? Not, not in any way 
other than to get the better okay, health outcome. Just, just to be clear, you're saying that some of those stores you mentioned there, I should disclose, you're on the board of uh, West Farmers as well, but you are saying they need to reopen. If they're well, COVID safe, have a plan, they should yeah. do it today. Well, that, well, I'm asking why not? I'm asking why not? Why not in the, in the first lockdown when they were open, they were, they've COVID safe work plans. My question is, why not? What about and, and there has to be a plan. Hmm. You know, we want to see what this threshold is, but there has to be some certainty, David, because people just can't get on with their lives at the moment. What about state borders? Your budget submission that you've released uh, this, this weekend, uh, reopening the economy is your number one point. Are you saying state borders should all be reopened now as well? Well, well, well state borders are meaningless and they're pointless and closing them is a job killer. 70% well, of our just on economy... That though, to, be, to be fair, the federal court has found that they are effective in helping to protect the health of people in this virus. Well, I think the longer this goes on, we'll see. We'll see. Because 70% of our economy is a services economy. You know, tra uh, tourism, hospitality, retail. Those things are very dependent on open borders. It would be better to move to the local lockdown approach, which is, which is about very severe containment at the local level. Well, the West but, Australian but at the Premier... very least, David, can I just say something yeah. else about these borders? At the very least, could we get one permitting system? The... Could we get one set of rules? You know, like I I'm hearing story after story after story of people who've got permits who can't get through, total confusion, uh, people who can't get to their livestock on their farms, people who can't get heavy machinery through. through. At the very least, can we at least get one set of rules about the permitting? That would be a start. And then a gradual, careful, in our budget submission, three-month plan to open our borders carefully and focus on those local lockdowns. Let me tell you a few other elements of your budget submission. You've called for a 20% investment allowance for all business at a cost of $10 billion a year. Uh, just explain to us, could business uh, just claim for investments they would have made anyway or would there be some requirement to show this is a, a new investment that deserves this tax break? Well, let, let's go back to just the total point of our budget submission and I'll come back to the investment allowance quickly. You know, our, our budget submission is about uh, recognising that we're in the worst position we've been in for 100 years and there's no guarantee that we'll just easily find our way out of this. Our submission is about creating jobs. Our submission is about setting the country up for the things that have to be done to make us stronger into the future. And that's about obviously opening up the economy, but it is about getting business investing again to go to your business, your investment allowance question. Uh, and business investment has been woeful. It is in free fall. So an investment allowance, what does it do? It's a 20% bonus deduction. It will make things that, aren't, that don't stack up now stack up. What does that do? For someone ordering machinery, it creates a work order. That means someone gets starting on something. Um, it means companies start to fast track their online, their digital. That mm. creates work. But for I guess my question else. was: Would it also go to things that already stacked up that were going to happen anyway? If Bunnings, for example, were going to refurbish some stores, uh, and we're going to do that anyway. Would they be entitled under this plan to claim a 20% allowance as well? Well, in our plan, they would. But this is a matter for the government. Well, but but you've got to remember this question, David. What we don't want, this is the biggest risk, what we don't want is people slowing stuff down either. So we think it should be broad, it should be simple, it should be available to all parts of the economy. Because if, if people bring forward the construction of shops, that's thousands of people who get work, people who work in the shop once it's, once it's open. You know, if you bring forward your maintenance of your big mining equipment, uh, that creates a whole lot of work orders. And bit by bit, job by job, dollar by dollar, we will start to put this economy back together again. Has the Business Council now given up on the idea of a company tax cut? No. I mean, look, you know, at some point, some government in the future is going to have to deal with this. One of the highest rates in the world. You see, the French, even the French this week, announcing that they were going to lower their business taxes. Uh, we've now got a bizarre two-tier tax system. Uh, but, and we are always very clear on this, David, as you and I have talked about many times, we don't want one of the lowest rates, we just want a competitive rate. Because here's what companies tell me. They say, Jennifer, when I go to my global board to get capital, I find it very difficult because I've got one of the highest rates in the world and I've got a whole lot of regulation that I've got to get through. So at some point, David, someone has to get this done. 
You but for now, the yeah. job is to get investment going again because it will be the ticket to creating jobs. You also highlight the problem of energy prices in this submission. You make the point that investors aren't going ahead with projects because, quote, policy uncertainty is deterring investment. Are you now calling for the government to abandon its approach of underwriting hand-picked projects? Well, we've always been calling for that to, to, to not occur because we think it squeezes out uh, important investment that the private sector would do. I mean, there's a lot of pent-up investment in the energy sector, investment that would lower prices, and if we don't lower energy prices, it's going to be hard to get the economy really going again, and projects that are going to reduce our emissions. So let's prioritise investment in those projects that are going to lower prices, in those projects that are going to lower our emissions so that we get our energy system set up for the future. And one of those things is to not underwrite projects and compete with the private sector. The other one is to remove all these moratoriums on conventional and unconventional gas that are holding us back in one of those key transmission Well, just on fuels. that, what about underwriting gas infrastructure? Is that something the taxpayer should do? Well, let's have a look at that. You know, but whenever you do something that the private sector would do, that's something government is not going to do. That's a road or a hospital or a school. Be very careful about spending so, the taxpayers' money yeah. when the private sector would do it. So you're not convinced that underwriting gas infrastructure is a good idea? Well, let's have a look at what the plans are. I know it's being talked about, but, you know, here's my kind of fundamental proposition. When governments do things that the private sector mm. would normally do, they discourage private sector investment. More importantly, they divert important taxpayer money away from other vital areas. OK, a couple of quick ones. Uh, the JobKeeper wage subsidy, um, you point out that this is costing a lot of money and we need to transition away for it. Some companies have been putting their hand out for JobKeeper and at the same time paying healthy dividends to shareholders. How can that be justified? Well, let's, let's just uh, talk about JobKeeper very briefly. JobKeeper was a blunt but nation-saving instrument. Um, we believe the government has to stay the course uh, in phasing it out because it's having a lot of distortionary effects. You hear of, you know, restaurants making a 75% increase in profits when they haven't been open. That doesn't make any sense. But, but let me just make two points about, about this. Let me go to executive bonuses first. Uh, in my view, companies should not be paying executive bonuses if they are receiving JobKeeper. It wasn't designed for that. It was designed to keep people working. Dividends is a more complicated thing. Dividends usually are a long-run policy of companies to their shareholders. And let's not forget who are many of the people who receive dividends. Self-funded retirees, mums and dads investors, and of course everybody's superannuation. Sure, but it's been bankrolled so, by taxpayers here, isn't well, it? I mean, there's and, a list of companies just, I can give but, you that, that have taken uh, yeah. JobKeeper and then paid the shareholders. But I was just going to say, if I were those companies, I'd exercise some very careful judgement about these. Certainly on executive bonuses, I think companies should not do that. I think on dividends, I think companies need to exercise very careful judgment. What, OK, what does that mean? Domino's Pizza, for example, took $3.2 million in JobKeeper, grew its profit by more than $4 million. Yeah, as I said, look, dividends is a more complicated thing, and, 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 but bonuses, I don't think there's any question. I would just urge those companies go, that, to really think about these decisions because we have to build community right. confidence, but it also goes to the point, David, we have to wind this thing down according to the government's timetable. Okay. A final one on superannuation. If the government does cancel the scheduled increase in the compulsory employer contribution, is there any guarantee wages would rise? Look, I think the super thing is just one of these really tough decisions. On the one hand, we want to make sure that we're building a dignified, adequate retirement income system for Australians. On the other hand, at the moment, any pressure you place on wages is a pressure you place on jobs. And we've also got this inquiry into the superannuation system. My view is we should wait to see what that inquiry says, because if we are going to increase that contribution, we want to make sure that we're putting it into a system that's working, that's functioning, uh, that actually makes sure that people have an adequate, dignified retirement income. All right, Jennifer Westacott, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you.